the transition to spring also signals road construction season, and taxpayers are asked to file now. We explain in this week's Capital Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capital Report. I'm Julie Bartke. Construction season on Minnesota roads is just around the corner. The Department of Transportation says there are several projects in the books for this construction season, which officially kicked off on April 1st. Funding for those projects begins, in most cases, with the legislature. Here to discuss his transportation bills, we have the chair of the Senate Transportation and Public Safety Committee, Senator Scott Dibble. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Julie. Senator, let's begin with a question that really anybody driving Minnesota roads these days is noticing. There are a lot of potholes. It seems they're springing up daily. Are there any provisions in either of your bills that are going to address this issue? Well, sure. Um, the, the bill that we heard in committee last night, uh, which is the finance article that will go into the supplemental budget bill that Dick Cohen ultimately will be carrying. He's the chair of our finance committee. Um, has about $138 million in one-time uh, general fund money, of which a significant portion of that is devoted um, to our local roads improvement program and our state roads improvement programs. And of that, we set aside um, quite a bit of money specifically to repair the damage from this extremely harsh winter. We, we also allow some money to be made available to cities under the population of 5,000, which typically wouldn't enjoy these resources, as well as township roads, uh, which is really important. Of course, they're responsible for a, a great many of the miles that we travel, townships, small cities, municipalities, counties, and then state, state highways as well. Senator, you do chair two transportation committees. Let's talk about both of your bills. What are right. some of the key provisions that you think Minnesotans need to know about? Well, in the finance article, of course, uh, what folks need to be focused on is we're getting quite a bit of money on a one-time basis to address you know, really pressing transportation needs. Uh, folks might be familiar with the corridors of commerce where we uh, uh, are building those connections between our towns and our regional centers, both in the metro but also in greater Minnesota, where there's a real pent-up demand on the part of businesses so they can get their goods to market, um, so they can expand that factory, so that um, they can uh, address safety issues and just get things going that have been waiting. Sometimes uh, um, the, the bottleneck on getting these corridors built is doing some improvements to the local roads so that they can be turned back and so the state facility can come through. So we're getting about $30 million into that. We also have a transportation and economic development initiative, which really pairs private dollars and local match dollars again to benefit economic development opportunities throughout the state. It's pretty exciting. Uh, we're getting some additional one-time dollars into capital needs for transit systems in the metropolitan area. But um, while this is a significant set of resources that we're putting forward that will be in the supplemental budget bill, like I said, um, it really is just a, a temporary measure because these, these, this is not sustained ongoing dollars, the investments that we need to put into our transportation system to really get out of it what we need with a growing population, declining resources, with growing pressure on our roads, you know, the loss of gas tax dollars to inflation and fuel efficient cars and the generation that doesn't want to drive cars as much. So we have this second bill coming out uh, tomorrow. We'll have the, the hearing on that in our Transportation Finance Committee. And what are you excited about in this second bill? Well, uh, we're, uh, there's some innovations in there to create, like I said, that sustainable approach to building both transit systems in the metro, uh, Greater Minnesota Transit, which is a growing need uh, for folks, not just sustainable in its funding. Sustainable in its funding. How so? Um, uh, just getting some sustained uh, general fund appropriations um, that are right now are being diverted to other purposes. Um, so that's actually not growing revenue, but that's reprogramming dollar, dollars that should be coming into the transportation system. And then, um, you know, the problem with the gas tax as we have it now is that, of course, it's pegged on a per gallon basis, uh, and it loses ground to inflation very, very quickly. It loses ground to fuel efficient vehicles. It loses ground to the fact that. Um, folks are driving less for a whole bunch of different reasons. And so uh, we're um, uh, enacting a gas tax on a, on a per price basis sold at the wholesale level, kind of like the sales tax. We're all familiar with the sales tax that we pay on the things we buy in the store. And of course, the sales tax um, uh, kind of grows with the price of goods. And so it kind of keeps place with our pace with our inflation and our growing economy. And so 
um, that's what we're attempting to do in this bill. And your counterpart in the House, Frank Hornstein, he, his bill came in at roughly $750 million. Where right, do you see right. yours? Ours is the same. It it's is. It's a similar proposal, yeah. And what are its chances? We're hearing in the House that it could be dead. Right. Well, um, you never say never, never say die in this business. So we're going to have a good hearing. We're going to pass it on to full finance. And then there's this tremendous campaign that's underway to support this initiative. It's got over 200 organizations and literally thousands and thousands of people are engaged, contacting their legislators, contacting our leadership, the governor and the like. Um, and so we'll just continue to try to make that case, create the political space to make greater possibilities here. And this kind of goes back, it harkens to conversations you and I have had on this set, you know, going back years ago, right. where you just think it's time to move away from the gas tax as mm -hmm. we know it. Is this the first step in that direction, or is this kind of what you think is going to be set in yeah. stone for generations to come? I think this is the first step. Um, I think we really do need to look at, clear, clearly gasoline itself is going to be a declining source of energy in the transportation sector over time. It's going to be the main source of fuel for the foreseeable future. So completely scrapping it probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And there's a rough correlation to how much people drive uh, and how much they use the roads and what they would pay in the gas tax or this wholesale tax on fuels. Um, but uh, it's a loose correlation and much looser than it used to be uh, because of all the different variations in fuel economy, the sizes of vehicles, the impact on the roads and stuff. Um, so, you know, we're looking at uh, mileage or a combination of mile and weight. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ideas out there. We also have to get a lot more innovation out of our system, better materials, better ways of financing and delivering um, these projects, different modes of transportation. So we're getting more transportation for the dollar, concentrating on what we really want out of our transportation system. And to that point, you've always been a strong advocate of mass transit, light rail. Is there enough money in your proposals to kind of go move forward in, in any of the proposals, actually, this session, you know, bonding, et cetera? Where are we with light rail, and where are we with road construction projects? Is there enough money to fix the big the big? Well, in the, in, the, in the bill we'll be hearing tomorrow, certainly there is. So we would put some additional sales tax in the metro area, uh, like all other metro areas do, to build out uh, not just uh, light rail, but uh, make sure our bus system is strong, make sure our transportation for seniors and, and others is, is strong. Um, some of these uh, arterial busways, express busways, regular route bus service, um, that sort of thing, streetcars are, are an important initiative. Um, and, and that's really to create choices and modes and connections. Uh, commuter rail, not every mode serves every area and not every trip is completed on a single mode. And so we need to create those connections, cars, bikes, you know, people, complete their trips in one way and then you know, do the last mile in a different way. Um, so yeah, there is sufficient dollars to build out what we call the transportation policy plan, the regional map, the vision for transit ways in the metro area, and then also um, to, to bolster and support our roads and our bridges in the metro and greater Minnesota. Okay, Senator Scott Dibble, we are out of time. We hope to get you back here later in session when the proposals are out of the floor, off Great. the floor, okay? Fantastic, thanks, Thank Julie. you. The naval commander who will lead the fleet's newest, most high-tech submarine, the USS Minnesota, recently paid a visit to the capital. Commander Brian Tanaka says, as a Rochester native, it's good to be home and thank those who support the military. We are very grateful and proud uh, for not only the support that we get from the state uh, via the Navy League, but we're also support, very supportive of the citizens and uh, of the legislature here in Minnesota for all the support that they give us. Uh, give us, as the Minnesota and the Navy, uh, allows us to do our job. Our challenges we have is that we don't know the Navy very well anymore. Um, if you put a matrix out uh, in terms of uh, favorability towards the Navy, but knowledge of, we score very high on favorability and quite low on knowledge of. We just don't have a lot of Navy presence anymore. So these state visits are extremely helpful. And as Brian mentioned, uh, the third week of August will be Navy week uh, in Duluth. And some may remember there was one scheduled for Minneapolis two years ago and it was canceled as part of sequestration. So there are only six in the country this year in Minnesota, Duluth is having one of those. Senator Charles Weger chairs the E-12 Finance Division. He's here to talk about his proposal. Thanks for joining us, Senator. Thank you, Joy. Let's begin with your education finance package this session. It's a roughly $41 million in state aid. Now, exactly who does this impact? Okay, it 
has an impact for all Minnesota school districts. The biggest part of our $41 million plus appropriation is for early learning. And three out of four dollars would go for early learning uh, opportunities. Uh, the key behind this is that if you're ready for K, you are much more likely to graduate from high school, on to college, and to eventually get a living wage job. That's the goal for the system, and the best investment we can make is early on, ready for K. And so for the three or four dollars that is spent, we put it into a few key areas. First, early learning scholarships. Last session, we had an additional $40 million for early learning scholarships for students high at risk and putting them in quality programs where we know there will be a return on investment where these students are very likely, these young learners are very likely to be ready for K. We've had bipartisan support in this program. Uh, we have $12 million additional funds that would go toward the early learning scholarships. Another area that we invest in is for early childhood family education. This is a program that was actually started almost 40 years ago. It's been rolled out throughout the state uh, for uh, a couple of generations now, very successful. And it's available not only for students at risk, but for all parents, all students, uh, right after birth, before kindergarten. And there's parenting classes available. There are great enriching uh, opportunities for students uh, you know, learning about uh, various uh, uh, reading skills, their physical cognitive development. Every school district, whether it's in Stillwater, Silver Bay, uh, St. Paul, there's early childhood family education. And I I like particularly the parent or sometimes grandparent involvement of people that want to get involved. It's a sliding scale for that participation. There's learning kits available and we have not added funds in this program since 2008 and I want to thank Senator Jerry Hughes who was the senator that I interned for that started that program and it's time for additional investment. We've had a great uh, response on that. So uh, almost 12 million in addition to the 12 million for the scholarships for high risk, high need uh, students, we put an additional nearly 12 million for ECFE. We also invest about 5 million for reading readiness and for just the overall K-12 readiness. And we have put uh, a number of uh, programs uh, perhaps on hold for trying to catch up on the formula, but we have not done enough in the early ed programs. And so for the uh, kindergarten readiness programs, there's, uh, there's more flexibility in what the district can do to best prepare students. Uh, we had great testimony from Anoka Hennepin, the largest district in our state, as to what these programs have done, particularly on the, uh, the K readiness program and the ECFE as well. They have closed the achievement gap in many areas in that district. And we've heard from around the state uh, where these programs, you invest in early education, it's gonna make a difference. There's also some additional funds in the early area for some high risk areas of our state, particularly in the Promise neighborhoods, right in St. Paul, near the capital, there's in the Frogtown area, there's an area that has been identified as the Promise neighborhood. They, we uh, have a $600,000 appropriation that would go there. Uh, it has a number of community resources involved, high parental involvement, working with students and their families. We're doing all we can to get that involvement, and also in Minneapolis for the Northside Achievement Area. So look, in terms of early education, we make a significant investment there, three out of four dollars, as well as many other areas. Let's talk a little bit about some of the things we heard in committee and just have heard as issues in the media and, and whatnot. You know, we have uh, Senator Alice Johnson had her expanding free breakfast to, to everybody. There's the expanding the school lunch program. We've heard about trying to lower class sizes. Does this <coughs> bill address any of those? On the, uh, the lunch program, yes it does. Uh, we had, I'm gonna, I commend Senator Johnson for her passionate advocacy for uh, nutritional uh, lunches, uh, 
meals that are available for students uh, as an important part of the learning process. If you're, you're hungry, you're not uh, as likely to pay attention and learn at the optimal level you should be. Uh, responding to concerns last year, uh, we have put funding in place so for those that are on free and reduced, uh, they will now be able to qualify for a free lunch. And that was included in the governor's right. bill, and it's in the House and Senate bill. It's a part of our bill as well, three and a half million. Anything to help reduce class sizes and also to help schools with declining enrollment, losing money. They're, they're going to be seeking more levies just to keep, to keep operating because of potential budget cuts. Okay, for additional uh, funds for students that have, or for the students in districts where there is a decline, we don't add additional funds. We put money in targeted areas for early education, which uh, you would get money regardless of uh, your losing in attendance. Uh, we, it's a complicated formula, and when you're funding districts that are losing in students, it creates a, a number of challenges, but uh, we've had a record amount, uh, nearly a half a billion dollars that was invested just several months ago, and we're very pleased that we're able to add to that with uh, over $40 million more. Okay, Senator Charles Weger, unfortunately, very short amount of time to talk about a very encapsulating bill, but we appreciate your time. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Julie. There's a lot yet to unroll for this, but uh, we're very pleased with the progress so far. Same sign. The legislature fast-tracked tax relief to Minnesotans, and the Department of Revenue fast-tracked the software needed to allow Minnesotans to file their returns and possibly reap the benefits of the legislature's actions. The idea is to file now. If you have not filed your taxes in Minnesota at this time, you should file now and file before April 15th and pay any taxes if any taxes are due. The deadline is April 15th unless you get an extension from the IRS. The department estimates that over a million Minnesotans still need to file their taxes. And many of them will benefit from $47 million in tax cuts retroactive to this tax, this previous tax year. If you've already filed, uh, there's nothing you need to do at this time. If you do not qualify for one of these 10 new deductions or credits, then you're done with your filing and, and you're, you have nothing left to do. If you do qualify for one of these new 10 deductions or credits, we ask you to wait. One of three things will happen. Number one, the department will note, will review your return, and if possible, will make the adjustment and send you the refund. Number two, if we cannot make the adjustment without more information, we'll contact you, ask for the additional information, and then make the adjustment and refund. And number three, if we cannot make the adjustment without an amended return, we'll contact you and ask you to file an amended return to make those changes. We will, after April 15th, after the filing season is over, we will analyze how many tax returns we need to review and to, and to analyze to see who needs any adjustments, and we'll make, at that time, available a date by which everyone can expect us to contact them if they qualify for one of these deductions. The 2014 Omnibus Liquor Bill does not include Sunday liquor sales. However, Senator Roger Reinhart says there is a provision that does have movement in that direction. The baby steps are what have had some traction this session, and they would do a couple of things. One is it would allow tap rooms, the breweries, uh, kind of the surly bill that people are familiar with, the tap rooms that are now in Minnesota to be open on Sundays. Currently, they're not able to be open. Um, two, it would allow both the tap rooms and the brew pubs who sell growlers, the 64-ounce containers, to sell those on Sundays. You know, I want to be really clear on this point. Uh, stores are still not open. In fact, when they are open, they can't carry these anyway. It's not allowed by Minnesota law. So the only place you can get a growler field is at the brewery or the brew pub. Um, and for those folks, it's a, it's a good in-house sale for them. Um, and then the third thing is what I call the growler freedom bill. Right now in Minnesota, if you like micro brew from three different places, you must own growlers from three different places. This says if you have a growler, you can get it filled anywhere you want um, as long as the brewer wants to do that. So... And so to your earlier point, this is kind of apples to oranges if you compare lifting the ban on Sunday liquor sales to what is actually happening. So what are you hearing from liquor store owners? Are they opposed to this or are they just kind of ambivalent about it? Because really it could signal baby steps. 
Well, it is baby steps. I mean, I'm not going to be not transparent about that. I'm still interested in seeing a full repeal at some point. But this seems to be the reasonable step forward. Again, it's not product that the stores carry. It doesn't, it doesn't permit them, even the ones who want to be open, to be open. So, uh, you know, it, we had a full hearing in Commerce, and the, the uh, liquor store lobby, the MLBA, said, are we crazy about it? No, but we really don't have any grounds to oppose it. Uh, and we didn't hear really from anybody else. And then when we heard the omnibus liquor bill that has these provisions in it, there wasn't a word. It was done in five minutes and passed by an overwhelming voice vote. I think there was one member dissenting. So, What about micro distilleries? They seem to be ramping up to try to get the same exemption. Sure. Actually, I, I wish the micro distilleries had brought me their bill. <laughs> no offense to Senator Pappas who is carrying it, but I kind of like having all these things together so we can have some uniformity on it. Um, they are getting a provision that allows them to do basically some on-site sampling. Um, Unfortunately, the bill that was brought forward does not have a provision to allow them to do it on Sundays. So this idea of equity, you know, the wineries already can sell up to 12 bottles on a Sunday. So why not the brewers and the brew pubs? And frankly, why not the distillers? I mean, there ought to be, we ought to have a uniform approach on this. We have a burgeoning micro industry in Minnesota. It now accounts for $80 million of revenue and 8,000 jobs. Why would we not want to take these small steps that help move that um, economy forward. My last question, understanding that this was an uphill battle from the get-go, how do you feel about knowing that at least some provisions have been incorporated in the liquor bill? Well, it's great that we're in the liquor bill, but we're far from there. Um, you know, the bill has gone now to the tax committee, where I know there is opposition in the tax committee. So, you know, it's conceivable that a committee that really doesn't have direct jurisdiction on these issues could try and take some of these provisions out if members feel strongly about it. You know, in the House, the bill has already gone to the full House. It's waiting for a full House vote with some but not all of the same provisions in it. My hope is to get you know it to the full Senate, and then we'll have a conference committee and work out a couple minor things. But that is one of my messages to people outside the building who think this is done because it makes sense and it's small steps forward. It's not done. Nothing's done in the legislature until the governor actually signs a bill. So. Dave Thompson joins me to talk about a proposal he is offering that would impact property that is taken after an arrest. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it, Senator. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So you're moving forward with a bill that would essentially make it easier for somebody who is falsely accused of a crime or just not convicted to get their property back. What was the impetus for this? Well, it was brought to me by some folks that are concerned about civil liberties and about overreach of law enforcement. Now, certainly I think I have a, a reputation at the legislature of someone who is very supportive of law enforcement and and, and I certainly am. But I think many people in Minnesota would find it uh, shocking that in the instance of some crimes, you can lose your property, and even if you don't plead guilty to anything, even if you're not charged with something, you may have to actually go into court to get your property back, and we're trying to remedy that. Go into court in what, in what manner? Like file a civil suit? What, what, how, what's the procedure at this point. That's exactly right. It's a, it's a civil procedure where you go into court to try to get your property back. And what this legislation would do is if in fact you plead guilty or you are found guilty by a jury or you even agree to go into some program uh, you know, in lieu of going to prison or something, then you still have to go through that same civil procedure to get your property back. But if for whatever reason you don't plead guilty, you don't agree to go into a diversion program, and the charges are effectively dropped, that you then don't have to go into court to get your property because, of course, that's costly and time consuming. What if you're found not guilty? I haven't heard you address that. If you're found not guilty, then you would get your property back without having to uh, go through that proceeding and spend money. And so what are some of the the details here? Would, does somebody have to pay for the impounding? Do they just get their property back, or do they have to pay some of the, the fees and fines that may have accumulated, like I said, like an impound lot. Well, what we would like to see and, and with this legislation is that if a person ends up uh, being completely exonerated or not having to plead guilty to anything of any kind, that they would get their property back with no charges at all. Uh, it seems to me that we, of course, as taxpayers, fund our criminal justice system and that if, uh, if in the best interest of the public the prosecutor tries to do their job but can't make the charges stick, that probably society should bear the cost of that individual um, you know, having their property taken from them 
in a, in, in a way that turns out to be improper. Senator, is this a problem? Is this, do you see that this is something that is abused? Oh, sure. It goes on a lot. Uh, this is not, uh, I don't believe in necessarily moving legislation for one of those things that happens uh, extremely rarely. But yes, I mean, uh, this sort of thing happens quite a bit where people are accused of a crime and they have property that is confiscated, deemed to be an instrumentality of the crime. And all this legislation is, is doing is it says, look, if in fact the person is exonerated, doesn't have to plead to anything, isn't convicted, that they get their property back at no cost to them and with no additional effort. Where does this legislation stand at this point? Do you have a hearing schedule, the, the bipartisan agreement? Give us some of the minutia. Well, your timing is incredible because I will be uh, in the Finance Committee tomorrow morning with this legislation to get it sent back to the floor. And um, what happens uh, procedurally here at the Capitol is we actually moved this bill to the floor last year, but with the interim, uh, then it has to get kicked back to a committee and sent back to the floor. So we plan to get it sent back to the floor tomorrow and we'll probably be taking a vote on this hopefully within the next couple, two, three weeks. Is it controversial? I haven't heard anything about it. You know, it was initially uh, because the it, it was a little bit uh, higher standard that the prosecution had to meet, but this is a case where um, law enforcement and, and folks representing prosecutors and civil libertarians that brought this legislation to me kind of sat down in a room and worked it out to the point where there is now no significant opposition. I will be honest with you, some in law enforcement uh, aren't crazy about it and would prefer we hadn't moved it, but for the most part there is, is pretty much agreement uh, and, and those who are opposed to it have gotten concessions to the point that they're not terribly upset anymore and that to me is an ideal outcome. Okay, Senator Dave Thompson, we will, of course, track your proposal. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. For the first time since 2008, the legislature is offering one large supplemental budget bill. On Thursday morning, the Senate began discussions on its provisions in the Finance Committee. Now, the other thing I need to tell everybody on this committee and everybody in this room, because I've had all sorts of people, as some of this has become known to, to a handful of people, and certainly to... Uh, the chairs, I've had people say, well, I hear the House is doing such and such and such and such, and why can't we do it this way? How can the House do it? And the answer is very simple. The House isn't abiding by the agreement. And we don't have an exact figure. We will show a budgetary balance that's actually a little bit beyond the $750 million in the spreadsheet. I don't have an exact figure for the House. You know, they, I think they've passed their bill out of ways and means, but I don't have the exact number. But the number we have is that they're having a balance of about $600 million. So despite what I'm told is a signed agreement between Senator Bach and, and, and Speaker Thiessen, um, <coughs> they couldn't abide by that agreement. And I want everybody in this room, whether member or otherwise, to understand that when you see these numbers and see these numbers uh, in a way that is to be distinguished from House numbers, that's how they did it. Um, they are keeping at the bottom line only $600 million, give or take. We are keeping at the bottom line $750 million, which was the charge I was given by Senator Bach. And that concludes this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching this week's Capitol Report.